Our first scripture reading is John 6, verses 35 through 41. Hear now the word of God for you and for me. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Addison. I want to welcome all the children. It's so good to see so many children back in worship. I know school has started for many. Uh, school is starting for some in the coming weeks. We're so thankful for the children of this church. Uh, at this time, for any child uh, between four years old and third grade who wants to participate in godly play can go with our children's director, Miss Sarah Kate, who's right over here. You can make your way down and, um, and have a wonderful time of godly play and kids' worship. Our second text uh, is from 2 Samuel, the 18th chapter, verses 5 through 9, 15 and 31 to 33. Uh, if you are new with us, uh, you need to know that we have been in a sermon series throughout the summer, methodically moving through texts that have been assigned to us by the lectionary, but exclusively from 1 and 2 Samuel. I, I have to be honest, I've never preached from 1 and 2 Samuel in a series uh, and there's been a lot of, I think, insight and formation, a lot of challenge. Uh, we'll meet some more challenge today as well. Uh, but today is our 10th and final week of this series, and we end with 2 Samuel 18, uh, 5 through 9, 15, 31 to 33. The King David ordered Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, his commanders, saying, deal gently for my sake, with the young man, Absalom. Absalom was one of David's sons. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So the army of David went out into the field against the army of Israel that was under the control of Absalom. And the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel, the army of Israel, were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened by circumstance to meet the servants of David, the commanders of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head, which was adorned with long flowing hair, got caught fast in the oak and he was left hanging from the tree between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then a messenger came, and the messenger said to the king, to David, good tidings for my lord the king, for the lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the messenger, Is it well with the young man, my son Absalom? And the messenger answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. In other words, he is dead. The king, David, was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and he wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, 
O Absalom, my son, my son. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, help us to pay attention enough to the cries of David and the cries of others we will meet in this text. And perhaps we will hear the echoes of our own cries. And perhaps you would lend us grace to meet us in this moment, to give us exactly what we need to be found faithful to you even as you are faithful to us. Form in us a heart after your own so that we would be more like Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I want to begin uh, this final sermon in this series by, by sharing the details of the events and and sort of the backstory of this text. Because I know when, when I just read it in our hearing, even skipping around some verses here and there, there's a lot to be known to make sense of what we just heard. I will say that as we get into it, uh, this is not a PG or PG-13 kind of text. Uh, the backstory here is very difficult. It's difficult to, dis- to consider, and it's difficult to discuss. It definitely has mature content. Even so, I find this text to be incredibly poignant in as far as it helps us to be more honest, 
uh, more uh, concrete, uh, more truthful about the depravity within our own heart and the depravity and brokenness within the world. So the backstory. King David, the great David, who slayed Goliath, who was uh, given the throne following Saul, the one who wrote so many of the Psalms, this wonderful worship leader, he is still on the throne. He is still the ruler of Israel. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, remember we spent some time uh, in the story surrounding David's great moral failing, that he was a king who had no problem taking that which did not belong to him. He had no problem taking even that which was prohibited by God's law and by uh, civil law. We remember the story of David with Bathsheba when he saw her bathing on the roof. He, he decided that he wanted her and he took her into his own bed and, and she became pregnant. And then when David des- devised a, a plan to to conceal her pregnancy or to pass it off to her husband Uriah, that plan failed. And then A second plan came to David's mind where he sent Uriah to the front lines of a fierce battle where Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, met his inevitable and tragic death. David then took Bathsheba into his own home, making her one of many of his wives, and she bore him a son. Last week, we talked about how the prophet Nathan confronted David in his sin, that he brought a message from God where David's sin was exposed and, and God's displeasure was communicated by the prophet. And while Nathan said that David's life would be spared, the same was not true for this son born to Bathsheba that he fathered. This son would die as a punishment for David's moral failings. Now you might remember that, that, that part of God's injunction Uh, delivered through the prophet Nathan, included a word about the perils David's family would face because of his sin. In 2 Samuel 12, 11, Nathan declared that God would actually raise up trouble against David from his own house, that his sin has consequences, not just immediate consequences, but but longstanding consequences. And Nathan said that your house will be troubled because of what you have done this day, that from within your own house, people will rise up against you. And what follows actually from 2 Samuel 12 to 18 is basically how that prophetic word was realized. Basically how that trouble came to pass and how David's family system would be dysfunctional and broken from that moment on. Now David had many children with many wives within his household. Uh, He fathered another child with Bathsheba, and we're going to talk about him in just a few moments. But for now, to make sense of this story, to understand what's going on here, you need to know about three of David's other children, just three of them. You need to know about David's daughter, Tamar, his daughter, Tamar, her brother, David's son, Absalom, and then their half-brother, a sibling of theirs from another mother, his name was Amnon. And we'll start with him. Amnon was very much like David. He was the kind of person that when he saw something that he wanted, he simply took it. Regardless of prohibition and regardless of law, if Amnon saw something that he wanted, he took it. He was presumably the heir to the throne. He was David's oldest child at this point. Amnon wanted Tamar. He wanted Tamar as his own. And she, of course, was his half-sister. This was prohibited against God's law, against the moral law of the day. But, but Amnon wanted her. And so he feigned an illness, told his father that he wanted to see Tamar for her to bring him food, to bring him cakes, to nurse him to health. She's thinking that's why she's headed to his quarters when all of a sudden... Amnon violated her, his half-sister. The text goes on to say that Amnon kicked Tamar out of his room and bolted the door and that he hated her with a great hate. Tamar wept and she mourned over this violation. 
Now, as a little footnote here, I, I want to say that this is an impossibly difficult story for all of us to digest. I don't care who you are, but especially for those one in four girls and those one in six boys, statistically speaking, who have experienced some sort of sexual abuse, texts like these terrorize us. They're, they're hard to uh, engage. Another footnote, I think it's important to say that violence against women in the story of David and his family repeat itself over and over and over again. It terrorizes us as we read these stories of, of violence against women. And what is interesting, I'd like to suggest to you, what's interesting is that the, the moral calamities and the moral uh, fractures and the, the relational fractures within the family of David all seem to begin. Trouble seems to be on the horizon when a woman is degraded, when a woman is violated, when violence against women is, against a woman rather, is perpetrated. And I think we're on firm footing to say that any society, that any nation, that any institution, that any church, that any community, that any family rises and falls in relationship to how we honor or dishonor girls or women. It's true in the biblical text and it's true on the pages of history. When women and girls are dishonored, calamity befalls that family. Calamity befalls that church Calamity befalls that society. It encourages us to remember the honoring and the pursuit of equality and justice for girls and women in every community in which we find ourselves in. There is a whole sermon series just in that, but I'm going to leave it right there for now. Upon learning of Amnon's violation of Tamar, his half-sister, David, the narrator says, was angry. But even so, David refused to discipline his son. He didn't do a darn thing. He knew about what Amnon had done to his sister, David's own daughter. He knew it, and he did nothing. Tamar's cry for justice falls on the deaf ears of her father, King. And David's abdication of his moral and legal responsibility only reveals the depravity within his own heart. It only reveals the complexity of this character who at once is the more, a moral hero and yet at the same time is a moral failure. If David's first sin was the sin of commission, meaning the, the acts that he committed in adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah at his order, then his unwillingness to bring his son to justice is a sin of omission. And both, church, are equally deplorable in the eyes of God. God hates both the sins of commission, but also the sins of omission. Unlike David within this story, however, there is one character who is ready to act. One character who's ready for vengeance or perhaps justice, and that is Tamar's full brother, Absalom. And he was resolute in not allowing Amnon to get away with this atrocious crime. He was ready to do what his father refused to do, punish Amnon for violating Tamar. So Absalom set a trap for Amnon and killed his half-brother, David's oldest son, and because he was the oldest son, the presumed heir to the throne, Absalom was in fear of his life, and he fled Jerusalem. He fled, fled the nation. Following two years in exile, Absalom returned through various circumstances with the hope and promise of reconciling with his father and his family. But that harmony, that reconciliation was short-lived as Absalom began to plot a coup against David as king. He was disgusted with his father for how he ruled and for his apathy and for his impotence when it come, came to the causes of justice. He believed that he could do a better job than his father David. And so he began to rally the people to, to upend David and his throne. And he grew such a following in this time. He grew such a militia, such an army, that he actually cast his father David off of the throne. And those who aligned with David, along with the king, 
were exiled. They crossed the Jordan River, a powerful image. We think about the Jordan River and the Israelites coming into the promised land, coming into the peace, coming into the reconciliation. But here, David is cast out and he's crossing the Jordan and he is going to be found in exile. But Absalom does not relent. He's not satisfied with David just leaving the throne. He goes after him. He crosses the Jordan as well and goes after his army. And it's within this text that we begin to put the pieces together. This is where David, as I read to you, says to his commanders to deal gently with Absalom, to deal gently with him. We don't know why exactly David says to, to deal gently with him, and we presume that when he says this, he means certainly don't kill him. We wonder if David's heart has softened, or perhaps he can't afford to lose another child. He can't afford to lose another one of his children. So we're not sure why David asked for the armies to deal gently with, with Absalom. But what we do know is that his orders were disobeyed. Another sin, another commission of disobedience. Those orders are cast aside. And the narrator, this is the story that I was reading for us this morning. The narrator states that, that David's soldiers randomly and, and through happenstance come to Absalom. And what's happened is that Absalom is on his mule and they're in this thick forest of Ephraim. And his hair is so beautiful and flowing. But as he's elevated on his mule, his hair becomes caught in a thicket from a tree, a great oak. And, and he's suspended there. And the writer uh, gives us the sense that he's suspended between life and death. And we're not sure as these commanders come upon Absalom if they're going to kill him or not. He hangs, as the narrator says, between heaven and earth. And sure enough, the commanders disregard David's order. Another act of disobedience, and they kill him. And then a messenger comes and tells David that Absalom has died. And he mourns. And in this beautiful piece of music, we can emotionally connect with David's mourning and David's grief. Oh, Absalom, my son, would I have died instead of you? Friends, this whole story... This whole story, which begins with the cry of Tamar, the daughter of David, and his refusal to hear her cry, and his refusal to meet her plight with justice. Now he ends the story with great weeping and mourning. And we have this sense that the story of David's family always ends this way. It ends with death destruction, division, and grief. So friends, this is the story that ends our summer series through Samuel. A complete and total and unequivocal downer. It's not often that you plan a sermon series like this and end on such a low note. To be sure, I do believe it's a story that makes John Calvin look like a genius. Calvin, one of our community's theological forerunners, argued that there is not one area of human life, there's not one area of society, there's not one system that goes untarnished by sin. That human beings are corrupt and they are corruptible. Calvin once wrote that, that human nature is not only destitute of all good, but it's so fertile in all evils that it cannot remain inactive. What Calvin is saying, that there's something about us that stems us all the way back to the Garden of Eden, that, that we can't help but to be active, that we can be complicit or, or we can be ambivalent or we can omit activity that perpetuates sin. And this isn't popular in our day and age. This doesn't mean, friends, let me be clear about this, it doesn't mean that we are not created in the image of God. It doesn't mean that God doesn't pursue us in great love without condition, but it does mean that we as human beings have a propensity to sin that we have in fact, as Calvin said, a depraved heart. And this story doubles down on that reality. Even when we don't want it to be active, even when we will the good, it doesn't always come to pass. Even though we want to do what's right, we don't always do what's right. The Apostle Paul said it well when he wrote, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. 
In, in, the, in the grotesque and disturbing details of this story, I think if we're honest enough, we see our own world in its pages. We see our own lives in the bylines. And, and that is precisely why, friends, I would argue that we need to read a text like this one. I said in the last services that this is not the text that gets people to come to church. But somebody on their way out at the 930 said, but it may be a text that keeps us in church because it tells the truth about us and about our lives. One thing I so appreciate about the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament is it's unflinching honestly about the way the world is. There's no pretense. And so on the pages of, of this story, we see lines from our own story and vice versa, sins of commission and sins of omission. We know what that's like. Lust, self-indulgence, pride and greed, violence against women and the vulnerable, moral impotence in the face of injustice, murder, political ambitions regardless of the cost, broken and divided families, immeasurable grief and compounded loss. And we might wonder as people of faith, is this story just gonna keep going and going and going and going? Is this the predestined plight of all of humanity? Is this our judgment? Is this, is this our curse? Are, are we just the same family as the family of David, just living the story in a different time? Or perhaps, perhaps people of faith may be bold enough to ask the question, is another story possible? Is there another story that can be written? Is there some way of pivoting away from the, the, the family story and the brokenness of David and the depravity of this narrative? And is another story possible? Our family was uh, at the Jersey Shore for a few weeks back in uh, July. Not the television version of the Jersey Shore, the nicer part of the Jersey Shore. Uh, one of the problems that many beach towns in uh, New Jersey have faced in the past several years is the ever-increasing aggression and boldness from seagulls. Uh, in prior years, you could actually go to the beach, you pull out a peanut butter and jelly sandwich from your cooler, you start eating it, you look at your kid building a sand castle, in a matter of seconds, a seagull has swooped down, taking the whole sandwich out of your hand and then fighting over it with other seagulls who now know that you're the guy with food and they begin to hover around you, dive bombing, seeing if you have any more. You could be on the boardwalk at one of these beach towns, you could be eating funnel cake or, or french fries and a seagull will come down and, and snatch it from you. There have been incidents where little children, little children have been attacked by seagulls and it's become a major, major problem. Well, this past uh, month, I was having breakfast with one of my college friends at, at, at this particular beach town that we go to and, and we were eating outside and I started to notice that the seagulls were encircling us. And I thought, well, Got to protect my pancakes, my, my omelet, because they're going to come down and they're going to get it. And I'm looking up, I'm eating very cautiously, kind of covering with my arm, when all of a sudden, all of a sudden from the, around the corner of the street comes a guy wearing a glove with a hawk tethered to his arm. And I'm like, who called that guy? And all of a sudden, he let the hawk fly away, the tether still kept him close. He flew to a bench, and on the top of the bench, the back of the bench, he just spread his wings. And all of a sudden, the seagulls were gone. I mean, they were out, totally out. So our server came over, and I was like, where'd that guy come from? And she said, well, we actually called him. I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? She said, well, there's a group of individuals in some little cottage industries that have started at all the beach towns in New Jersey, uh, people who own hawks and falcons and owls, and you can pay them, you can have them on retainer to come to your establishment to chase away the seagulls. In fact, towns and city municipalities at the beach have carved out line items in their budget to pay for these guys to bring their birds to the beach. Ocean City, New Jersey, this is a fact, budgeted a quarter of a million dollars this year for hawks, falcons, and owls on their beach and on their boardwalk. I thought we needed a little bit of levity 
to get to the main point. The parallel here works for me, right? The, the, the seagulls represent the violence. The seagulls represent the, the disruption. The seagulls represent the sin and the moral impotence and depravity so prevalent in our lives and in our society and world. And the hawk, right? The hawk is the intercessor. The hawk is the disruptor. The hawk breaks the cycle and breaks the pattern that we become so accustomed to. And friends, in the story of God, there is a disruptor. There's a hawk. There's a figure who intercedes on our behalf and on behalf of sinful humanity. And what is so fascinating is that that figure actually emerges from the family of David, from all places. The family of David, that this family line, right, this, this family line that seems doomed to repeat and repeat and repeat the same sins and demonstrate the, the, the same depravity is the very family that God uses to redeem the world. I mentioned earlier that Bathsheba had another son. His name was Solomon. And Solomon became king after David. And, and, and Solomon was perfectly imperfect, just like his father. But 26 generations after Solomon, 26 generations later, in a small town called Bethlehem, the house of bread, in the city of David, a child was born to a carpenter named Joseph and a young woman named Mary. Jesus is a direct descendant of the family of David. And the patterns of that family and the patterns of the human family are finally interrupted. And a new pattern and a new story has, be, has begun to be written where the cries of the abused and the cries of the violated are actually heard, where justice rolls down like streams of, of water, where sins are forgiven, where reconciliation sticks and where the kingdom of God dwells in our midst. Friends, Jesus Christ is the hawk. Jesus Christ is the great disruptor. He breaks the curse of sin and he breaks the curse of death and he liberates us from these depraved patterns that we become so familiar with, encircling us. Patterns that we see in David's household, in our own homes, in our own communities, that Jesus writes a different story and frees us from that being our story. And so, friends, if, if you're tired of the same storyline, if you're tired of the same expressions of depravity that you see written on the pages of your own life and the pages of the life of the world, I would invite you to turn to Jesus Christ. Turn to the hawk, the disruptor, the author and perfecter of our faith who breaks the chains, who cancels sin, who reconciles us to God and to one another, who forgives us and makes a way for us to embody a different story. All of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned. All of us need a disruptor. All of us need a change in the plot line. All of us need a savior. May we turn to Jesus Christ to be just that. For the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the world, may it be so. Amen.